I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you the latest news from the battlefront, analyse the issue of draft dodging in Ukraine, and we talk to foreign correspondent Colin Freeman about his experience reporting from the frontline city of Kupiansk. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody is going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Wednesday, the 6th of March, 2024, two years and 11 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, I'm joined by our associate editor, Dominic Nichols, Brussels correspondent, Joe Barnes, and recently returned from Ukraine, foreign correspondent, Colin Freeman. I started by asking Dom for the latest military updates from Ukraine. Well, hi, David. Welcome back. Uh, Hi, everybody. Let's start. It's going to be quite drone heavy at the start here, and I don't mean Francis is around, but let's start in Russia. Um, Ukrainian drone struck a Russian fuel and lubricants warehouse uh, earlier this morning. The governor of Russia's Kursk region, so that was one of the regions that borders Ukraine, said no one had been injured and that a fuel tank was on fire about 60 miles 80 k's ish north of the Ukrainian border. Russian telegram channels showed video of a large, large fire, damage to a building. They said it was a, an oil refinery in the in the district. This area is known for its iron mines, apparently. Now, you know, this continues the pattern. Ukrainian attacks have repeatedly hit Russian oil refineries and other energy infrastructure in recent weeks, particularly in that region, the Kursk region and Belgorod region to its, uh, to its just to its left, depending which way you hold the map, I suppose. This is obviously the second such strike in the border area in two days. We spoke about another one yesterday. Ukrainian drones are also said to have been shot down in Russia's Belgorod and the Voronezh uh, regions. This came from local Russian authorities. The drones shot down over Voronezh were said to have been heading for a military airbase and an oil depot, according to locals. Then down in Crimea, one report saying large areas of Crimea had its power supply cut off after a series of Ukrainian drone attacks overnight. Locals reported hearing explosions and sounds of uh, of air defence going off. This is according to the Odessa-based media outlet Domskaya. I've not been able to find anything else on that, which is quite odd, considering it would be a fairly big story, but I'm, I'm looking around. And then last night, in one of the largest Russian drone attacks on Ukraine in recent weeks, uh, the Ukrainian Air Force shot down 38 of 42 drones, Russian drones targeting eight regions across the country. This comes from the Ukrainian uh, Air Force. They said it was Shahid uh, uh, drones again, 131, 136 attack drones downed over the south, the centre, the west and the northeast of the country. Air alerts in some areas lasting more than two hours. Regional officials in Sumy in the northeast, they said several drone hits in or several drones had hit different parts of the city. Gave I've seen some details on, on casualties. I haven't seen any deaths yet, but a number of wounded. And in Kharkiv region, a school building was, was damaged in an attack. Power line hit in the Dnipro-Petrovsk region. That's coming from regional officials. Now, into the actual kind of ground movement itself, not a lot is the headline. But Russian forces have continued to attack Ukrainian positions around Avdivka, but have not made any confirmed advances. So I'm looking at reports and maps out of the ISW, Institute for the Study of War. They've showed other minor advances across the front, up and down the front in the east. They say positional fighting, which is a lot of attacks and defence from both sides, but no real movement. Positional fighting continued on the kupiansk svatove kremina line. That's northwest, west and southwest of Bakhmut and in the Donetsk Zaporizhia Oblast border area yesterday, but no no particular changes to the front line in, in those areas. But they also say that Russian forces were heavily used glide bombs in their seizure of Avdika back in, in Feb, mid-Feb and likely attempting to replicate the, those kind of tactics as they continue or attempt to continue their offensive operations pushing west along the front. Might well, I mean, we don't think they are suffering a shortage of artillery and glide bombs. Obviously, launched from aircraft, putting aircraft at risk. There's some some suggestion Russia is 
is keen or not keen but content to take the additional risk to its aircraft because of or possibly because of the the perceived benefit that they're getting at the moment and the momentum they 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 might say they are generating but it might might in, might lead to more aircraft losses in the next few days we will keep an eye out now then on the um sergey kotov the the most recent ship of russia's black sea fleet to be sunk by ukraine that country without a navy you may remember unless drones are Totally redefining what sea power looks like in the 21st century. Probably is actually views, please. Anyway, on the on that the assault ship that was that was sunk a few days ago, the HUR, so Ukraine's military intelligence department, today say at least 27 crew members were killed in that attack. Yesterday they said seven killed, 52 evacuated. I think there's 20 wounded as well, but they are up in their figure there. Then in today's MOD update, the Defence Intelligence update, they say the Sergei Koltov that was only commissioned in July 22 and was attacked twice in 2023, they say it was the third Black Sea Fleet vessel sunk in the last five weeks, which, you know, which it was. MOD, British MOD say that's likely, or sorry, they say likely because of these losses, the Black Sea Fleet Commander Admiral Viktor Sokolov was dismissed from his post on February the 15th. Now, his year isn't getting any better because today he and Lieutenant General Sergei Kobliash, um, a Russian general, have just had arrest warrants issued against them by the ICC, the International Criminal Court. The two men, quote, are each allegedly responsible for a number of war crimes, including directing attacks at civilian objects, the ICC said. Now, Kobliash is suspected, or is, is the, the warrant is because of his role as the commander of the long-range aviation of the Aerospace Force, i.e. responsible for the forces that are indiscriminately firing missiles into Ukraine and killing civilians. While Sokolov is suspected because of his position of the commander of the Black Sea Fleet. Now that was coming from the court, obviously based in The Hague. You'll remember March last year, the ICC issued arrest warrants for Putin and Maria lavova Belova, who's the Russian official allegedly overseeing the forced deportations of Ukrainian children to Russia. As an aside, Russia withdrew from the ICC in 2016 following the court's criticism of Russia's occupation of Crimea. And unsurprisingly, Russia has said they don't recognise these two warrants issued today. But in a statement this morning, the court said there are reasonable grounds to believe that the suspects also bear responsibility for the crime against humanity of intentionally causing great suffering. Yeah, so, I mean... We've discussed this before. Does it do anything to have these warrants out there? I mean, clearly, it's going to be very, very difficult to get hold of these people, including Putin, and get them off to The Hague. But got to start somewhere. And you've got to produce this this evidence or you've got to, sh- you've got to keep this, this news in the forefront of people's minds. If this is the context in which they're operating, then I think it's absolutely fair and appropriate that these arrest warrants are issued. Now then, on the, uh, the German leaks from the head of the Luftwaffe, in an interview this morning, Miguel Berger, who's the German ambassador to the UK here in London, he said Germany has no need to apologise for the for the leak, the release, the Russian release of the video call that, well, I talked about all sorts of bits and pieces, isn't it? He said, Mr. Ber- Mr. Berger said the leak was a Russian hybrid attack that aimed to destabilise the West and that some reactions helped Russia achieve those aims. He said, we have to be careful not to fall into the Russian trap of creating division. And regrettably, some media and some people have fallen into this trap. He was speaking on uh, BBC Radio Force Today programme. I mean, yeah, that's that's fair enough. But he also said that, well, he first of all, he said they were talking on a secure line. And, and you yeah, the WebEx system is secure, very difficult to hack. But, and, and Herr Berger did say that one of the, one of the, participants on the call dialed in from a hotel room and mr berger said you know you've got to be careful hotel wi-fi is not secure so well that, exactly right so why on earth are you doing it and that's that's where the um that's obviously where the i, I, well, I say obviously and that's where i think the hack got in because the uh, the, the the system otherwise is, is pretty well is pretty well secured but you know if you're dialing in from a hotel wi-fi then well more for you one well, more for more for us really final one Putin's foreign intelligence chief has spoken about French President Emmanuel Macron's refusal to rule out sending European troops to to fight in Ukraine. He's said these comments are extremely dangerous and irresponsible. Remember, Mr. Macron said last month there was no consensus on sending European troops to fight inside Ukraine, but that nothing should be excluded. Now, United States 
a number of other European members of the alliance, NATO alliance, distanced themselves from that comment, said there were no plans to do so, but never let an opportunity go. Asked about Mr. Macron's remarks, Sergei Narishkin, who's the head of Russia's Foreign Intelligence Service, the SVR, the sort of overseas intelligence agency, the main successor to what we remember as the KGB. Um, he said uh, the comments were deeply irresponsible. He said, uh, quote, this shows the high degree of political irresponsibility. <laughs> You'd know all about that. Of Europe's leaders today, in this case, the president of France, he was speaking on state television uh, last night, said these statements are extremely dangerous. It is sad to see this, sad to observe and sad to understand that the ability of current elites in Europe and the North Atlantic to negotiate is at a very low level. They more and more rarely demonstrate any common sense at all. I mean, guys, got to, it's tough being a, a, a Kremlin stooge these days, isn't it? Anyway, I'll take a pause there, David. Well, thank you very much for all of that, Dom. Joe, can I come to you in Brussels? What's been across your desk this morning? Yeah, hi, folks. Um, good to be back. So I think the most interesting thing from Brussels was yesterday, and it was the European Commission's big sort of defence industry strategy announcement. But I've broken that down for a Telegraph audience, and I'll go through what this could mean for everyone, because it's got implications for EU countries, for Ukraine, and for non-EU countries. So how I build it was the European Union could block exports of weapons to Britain and other foreign non-EU countries if war breaks out with Russia. So a top official said that plans had been drawn up to prevent overseas shipments of arms and civilian technologies to make up for any of the bloc's own shortfalls in the event of a security crisis. And this was Thierry Breton, the EU's industry commissioner, who was, as I said, announcing the bloc's defence industry plan and basically looking to put Europe's defence industry on a war footing. So the proposed overhaul was part of the wider strategy to boost Europe's uh, support for war-torn Ukraine and prepare for the mounting threat posed by Vladimir Putin's Russia. So basically, Brussels wants to massively boost joint weapons production and procurement among its 27 member states with essentially the ambition of one strengthening the continent's security two helping ukraine and three reducing reliance on the us so but as part of that the european commission basically called for new powers to control military exports to the bloc in case the war in ukraine escalates over its borders so Mr. Breton had this to say, the European Defence Investment Programme has prioritisation measures in it. Um, so European Defence Investment Programme shortened to EDIP, he said EDIP, contains a fully fledged security of supply pillar that is in it for crisis situations. Once this stage is declared, Pacific, Pacific measures, not like the uh, C, can be applied including priority rated orders on civilian products or defence products, depending on the situation. And why was this clause put in there? Basically, Joseph Burrell, the EU's top foreign diplomat, said that 40% of weapons and ammunition currently produced inside the EU are shipped overseas. So he's basically saying, look, there aren't shortages. We're not suffering from our ability to make enough weapons for ourselves. Probably not for making enough weapons for ourselves, plus Ukraine. But we're shipping them mostly overseas. These are companies making profits. They're basically saying, look, if we need to, we have got these package of measures we could use that would essentially stop companies from shipping outside of the EU and supplying EU member states only. So basically, member states would first have to vote to trigger the crisis situation which could include a security threat, so such as a, an invasion by Russia, or more general, the shortage, shortages of weapons. So potentially, if, if EU states continue to deplete their stockpiles in supplying Ukraine, which, say, is very much happening. So the measure basically resemble, resembles the export controls introduced by the EU on vaccine shipments at the height of the coronavirus virus pandemic, which basically sparked a vaccines war with Britain. That idea was basically companies would have to file export declarations to the European Commission and then before they could ship their vaccines overseas outside of the EU, the Commission would basically have to agree to that. I think Italy became the only country to block, I think from memory, about 250 to 350,000 AstraZeneca jabs 
to Australia as part of that. So it, it was very, it was used once. So we, it's hard to picture how this overseas export blockade system could work in practice. But yeah, elsewhere, the EU promised to team up with strategic, like-minded and international partners, which was the EU was excluded from any of the new schemes to defend, to boost defence production, basically because we're not an EU member anymore. It said Ukraine would be treated as a quasi-member state as Brussels seeks to make up for its recent failures to give Kyiv a promised 1 million artillery shells. And basically, the idea is that EU member states would be encouraged to come together to jointly place orders for, say, artillery ammunition, rockets, missiles, tanks, you name it, in basically, one, bringing down costs for them and then focusing all of their defence spending into one place and boosting sort of European Union businesses. So Margaret Vestager, the Commission Vice President, said that EU member states have spent more than 100 billion euros on defence since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And she said that almost 80% of that was spent outside of the European Union and the US alone accounted for more than 60% of this spending. Basically, that's it. So the strategy aims to have internal trade weapons within the bloc reaching 35% of total value of its defence market by 2030. And national capitals will also be encouraged to procure European weapons costing at least 50% of their own defence budgets in that same period, and that figure increasing to 60% by 2035. So an initial 1.5 billion euro fund has been committed for this, basically to help innovation, to offer tax breaks and investments to firms uh, looking to ramp up production. But uh, Thierry Breton, the commissioner, the industry commissioner, has said that this will probably be needed to rise to at least 100 billion for the EU to be able to outcompete Washington and the US defence industry. So I think that's an interesting remark there. Let's see if it actually comes to fruition and actually helps the EU ramp up and jointly procure weapons for Ukraine. You think that Back to the 1 million artillery shells, the ASAP scheme, that failed miserably. So Joseph Burrell said that they'd only managed to found about 350,000 of the million shells promised by this month for Ukraine. And they're hoping to basically fulfil that promise by the at least the end of the year. And then going to another interesting story, which I've covered for, should be on the website soon. The First Lady of Ukraine has reportedly snubbed an invitation to the White House because she didn't want to be seated next to the widow of Alexei Navalny. So the Washington Post reports that US officials had hoped images of Elena Zelenska and Yulia Navalny would have provided a powerful backdrop to President Joe Biden's State of the Union address on Thursday. But Kyiv reportedly expressed reservations after learning that Miss Navalny would, would be in attendance at the event. So while Alexei Navalny, who was found dead in a remote prison colony last month, largely considered to have been killed by the Russian states, according to most Western and right-minded people. He's held up as a poster boy of domestic opposition against uh, Vladimir Putin by the West, but his legacy is somewhat tarnished by many Ukrainians. The opposition leader was long criticised for his perceived failure to c- condemn Moscow's illegal annexation of Crimea in 20. 20- 14, which was overwhelmingly supported by Russian voters and him being a Russian politician was seeking to capture some of that momentum. So yet, yeah, while that is the reports, the official statements from the White House say that Ms. Zelenska had turned down their inv- invitation due to scheduling conflicts. Ms. Mrs. Zelenska's office also confirmed that she was basically attending, visiting Kiev with children from an orphanage. And that's why she wouldn't be able to be in Washington for the State of the Union address. And Miss Navalny's representatives also said that she would basically not be in attendance, citing fatigue. And I guess you can somewhat agree with that. So her spokeswoman, Kira Yarmish, said Yulia's husband died two weeks ago. She's been traveling all this time. Today is the first day she's been at home at all. Like any human being, she needs time to recover. And so while she very much appreciates the invitation, she needs to recover for at least a little now. And one US official who was cited in the Washington Post report said the Russians' decision not to attend had not been communicated to Kyiv, but they also said that it was understood that 
President Zelensky's administration is also keen to put a bit of distance between itself and Joe Biden because of the opposition, the Republican opposition to the $60 billion support package that is being blocked by Republicans. So essentially, in a bid to get this bipartisan support, Zelensky wants to show that there is a little bit of dis distance between him and Biden. And that is two interesting stories I'm looking at today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Joe, and thank you, Dom, earlier. Coming up, we hear from foreign correspondent Colin Freeman about his reporting from the city of Kupiansk in eastern Ukraine. Colin, really great to have you back on. We were obviously, Dom and myself were out in Ukraine for the past two weeks. We missed you, sadly. You are out east. So I know there's a couple of stories you want to speak about. Could you start just by telling us about your trip to Kupiansk? Yes, so um, Kupiansk is a city on the in, on Ukraine's northeast corner, about 20 miles, 25 miles from Russia itself. And uh, I think as a loose shorthand, you could call it the uh, a town that sits right on the, the kind of northeast end of the front line. If you imagine Ukraine's current front line stretching about a thousand miles from the, the northeast down to the, the south and Kherson. Um, we went there just uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the weekend before last. I think it was a little bit of a blur now on a Saturday afternoon. It uh, it, it has quite the history in the war so far. I'll show it, 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 uh, so in the war so far, Kupiansk, it, it sits on top of a hill overlooking the Russian border. And at the start of the war in February 2022, it did actually fall into Russian hands the local mayor allegedly decided to surrender the city to the Russians on the ostensible grounds that that would uh, save bloodshed. Ukrainian officials did note that he belonged to a pro-Kremlin party and he was duly charged with treason. Um, his current whereabouts, I think, are unknown. But anyway, Kupiansk had about six months under Russian occupation. The Russians tried to use it as a sort of showcase town for the benefits of Mother Russia's bear hug, as it were. Um, there were cultural events organized, aid packages were sent in, and some of the local, the, the Russian political parties, including uh, Vladimir Putin's own United Russia Party, even set up um, political party branch offices there. However, if you weren't prepared to go with the programme, as it were, then there was a very high chance you would uh, get carted off to jail. We've seen this kind of thing elsewhere in places like um, Russian-occupied Kherson as well. And lots of reports of people being hauled off into detention and tortured if they chose to demonstrate on the streets or whatever. A fairly familiar story, really. Anyway, in September 2022, Kupiansk was duly liberated again during the big northeast counteroffensive that the Ukrainians carried out. However, since about August of last year, August 2023, the Russians have been bringing pressure to bear on Kupiansk again, trying to um, mount a, a renewed assault. In, I think, August of last year, a partial evacuation was organised. And by the time we got there a couple of weeks ago, there was hardly anybody on the streets. It really was pretty much a ghost town. The Russians apparently have about 40,000 troops massed in the sort of plains outside of Kupiansk. And the fear is that it's going to become another Avdivka. It could be the next place where the, the Russians try and mount a big push. And Colin, what was your experience talking to the soldiers? I mean, maybe we can talk about it a bit later, some of our, and with Dom as well, some of our thoughts about where we are in this in this war and where it might go in the next few months. What was your impression and understanding of the morale, of their training, that sort of thing? Did you speak much to them about that? Yes, we, we spent a bit of time with an artillery unit just outside of Kupiansk, who were, were actually, the Kupiansk lay between them and the Russian lines, so they were firing artillery over the city and onto the Russian lines, which the nearest ones are about only about five, seven, ten miles from Kupiansk now. Compared to when we were in Avdivka, which was the earlier in our trip to Ukraine, the mood seemed a bit better. They didn't complain so much of lack of artillery shells, which was a very prominent and theme when we were down outside Avdivka. And they seemed more confident that they would be able to hold the Russians off. 
partly because of the advantages that they had on the ground in Kupiansk. I would say that the city sits on a hill on a large escarpment several hundred feet high. And then there's also a river, which at the moment is a kind of overflowing <coughs> trench of ice and sludge, which would certainly make any Russian advance quite difficult. So so the, the, the mood was more buoyant. Um, having said that, I did feel fairly sorry for these soldiers. Um, their life these days is living in a hole in the ground, in a field, next to their, or just near their artillery pieces, where they'd spent most of the last three months without a break. This pit is covered over. It's relatively secure from artillery, but it's pretty uncomfortable. You've got mud walls, you've got mud floor, you've got a, a little stove heater for warmth, but n not, not a pleasant life. And also there is the threat of drones overhead all the time, including when we went there. We went to observe them firing their artillery and I think on two of the occasions when we went out, just the, on the relatively short walk from the from the dugout where they lived to the, where their artillery piece was, which was hidden in some woods, on both of those occasions we had to quickly return before the weapon was even fired because there was warnings of a, a Russian um, drone I I in the area, which, um, while it wasn't armed, could have alerted uh, the Russian forces to our presence and given them a given them an area to strike in. Thank you so much, Colin. Just before we move on to your second story, what was your interaction like with the locals? Because as you said, I mean, so many thousands of people left Kupyansk because there was deportations back to Russia during the occupation. What, what about the people who stayed? There, there, there aren't many there now, but of the few we spoke to, there's a few kind of hanging around at the local church. We spoke to one woman who actually spoke English. She was a local GP. She was was not looking forward to the idea of the Russians coming back, but like so many other people there, uh, she doesn't really have any idea of what else that what else she would do with her life. I suspect the place may get even quieter if at any point the church shuts down, because that often tends to be a kind of talismanic presence for any remaining people in one of these ghost town frontline areas. If the church shuts down. It's a seen as a withdrawal of a, a hub of community support, a place where they could get a, get help if they need it, and also meet other people, and be also seen as a sign that look, if the church isn't here, then I don't think it's good that we should be here either. So um, yeah, it, hard to say really what will happen in Kupiansk in coming months. But of all the town, I've been to numerous ghost towns up and down the front line in the last few, in the last couple of years, and this place really was uh, pretty damn quiet. Well, thank you so much for talking us through that, Colin. Let's move then to your other very big story from the past few weeks about draft dodging, essentially. This is follows on from the news that the Ukrainian army is seeking recruits, many, many more thousand people to join the armed forces, to join the fight against Russia, and they're encountering some problems. Who did you speak to and what are they doing? So the, the background to the story, of course, is that the Ukraine is um, debating in its parliament at the moment a mobilisation order that could mobilise up to another half million people the age of recruitment as well as the age of military conscription is potentially being reduced from 27 to 25 which might sound quite old to many readers you might be listeners you might be wondering well why don't we have recruitment at 21 22 the idea is to try and protect the younger generation from the threat of war and the, and the mental scarring and physical risks of course that would ensue um, however that that is uh, a luxury that ukraine feels it is increasingly unable to afford, hence the reduction in the um, in the recruitment age. Um, our, through a, a rather resourceful fixer that we used, we managed to uh, speak anonymously to uh, a couple of people who were dodging the draft. One guy, I'll call him Sergei, he was 38, and he had family, but he only had one son who was 18, which would mean he was not eligible to dodge, to, to, was not, would not be eligible to dodge the sorry to he would be el draft eligible pardon me yeah the fact that he had children was not an excuse and uh, yeah he was actually refreshingly candid about why he was dodging the draft he said i don't want to get given a gun and get two two sessions of practice down at the firing range and then get sent off to black backmut to get blown to pieces that was his kind of rough excuse he wasn't saying which some people say oh you know i don't believe in this war or all our politicians are corrupt 
why should I fight for them? He didn't really make any attempt at self-justification. But it, it didn't sound, he didn't make draft dodging sound much fun, really. He said he spent all this time in he locked in his flat. This was to avoid the attention of the draft patrols that um, patrol his home city of Odessa quite often. He spends his time watching TV, watching Man United on the football, and occasionally emerging very late at night to do a little bit of cab driving. By his own admission, he said it was not a pleasant life, and he lived in fear and dread of the draft officers knocking on his door every uh, uh, every so often, which they have already done. The fact that he failed to answer the door that time means he he knows they he knows is likely to come round again for him. And yeah, he said the paranoia was getting to him. He was taking antidepressants and so on and so forth. Not a pleasant life. One thing that he was also doing, though, was constantly checking a draft dodging app, which is available on the Telegram messenger service. Basically, what you what it does is it, it shares tips among draft dodgers as to various legal moves to excuse her from the draft, various excuses you can come up with. And it also has a live tracker of all of where all the current draft dodge, draft patrols are in you in, in in whichever city you are. So in Odessa, for example, there was this um, section on the app that he was using, which will show you where it just reported sightings of draft patrols. One on this street corner, four soldiers on that street corner avoid this market area. Beware, this draft patrol have just done a raid on this gym where they like as in like a gym where people go to work out no doubt in the hope of seeking young fit like young men who, who clearly got no excuse not to be out in the field um he consulted this thing constantly and it was notable that um, you know while his voice in the war is not one you hear very often in this nation that you know is regarded worldwide now as you know a, a, a nation of warriors He's far from alone. I mean, the, the Ukraine section of this draft dodging app alone had something like 70,000 followers. And while I'm sure some of them were journalists like me and also perhaps some vigilant draft patrol people, I think a, a large number of them were other people like him. He did make it fairly clear that he was by no means alone in um, in seeking to dodge the draft, nor did he suggest that there was much stigma involved in it. He said he had plenty of friends who were doing the same, and he often used to tell his taxi driver customers, look, sorry, I'm not going to take you there because I've just seen from the draft dodging app that there is a draft patrol there. I'll drop you off somewhere else. He said most people were fine about it. And did you get a sense, I mean, there's, there's, there's so much to talk about here, I mean, did you get a sense of how, I mean, looking at the end of your article is very interesting, the quotes, guys who don't really want to fight can always do some operation behind the front lines like cooking or driving. I, I've heard that a few times from people saying, if you don't, you, you've got to do something, but uh, people who don't want to fight, actually, it's much better to not have them at the front because they can become a huge li- liability quite quickly. Is that a sense you got? And would it be interesting to hear a little bit more about his, his allegations of corruption within the system? Yes, well, th- th- this is something you hear quite often from from people saying, uh, like, when you ask experienced serving soldiers, what do you think about the draft dodges? I, I ask quite a few serving soldiers, just hoping to get a sort of salty quote saying, oh, they, they should be brought to the front and sent straight to the front lines or whatever. And actually, most of the time, you just got a shrug and a comment along the lines of, well, look, if they don't want to fight, they're going to be no use here anyway. We all have to depend on each other here at the front lines. So, frankly, if they don't want to be here, they're going to be a danger to us and to themselves. The other comment you got, though, was, well, they, they can come and they can drive a truck or work in a back office or do some rear echelon function. I, I do think, though, that probably doesn't really address the problem that much because, while most armies are composed of perhaps you know four fifths backup people to one fifth spear point fighting forces, that there, there, there does that there is a requirement for those frontline infantry troops who do things like charge trenches or operate in forward reconnaissance units and do the tough, rough frontline stuff where the rate of uh, casualties is very high. And so simply saying that people can just go and do some back office job, that is not going to apply for everybody. And I think that is a problem that is going to become more acute 
in Ukraine as time goes on. The, 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 the other issue, as you just alluded to, is the issue of corruption. Odessa, where we met this giraffe dodger called Sergei, is a, a case in point. The city is notorious for having, having had a, a history of corruption within its draft squad officers. The draft is a great opportunity, actually, for corruption if you're running a draft squad because you can, you're can you in a position where you can take a backhander from somebody to uh, uh, let them avoid spending a year or two of their lives, even if it's just during normal peacetime, a year or two of their lives as a conscripted serviceman, which is never normally much fun. And then, of course, at, at the moment, it also means potentially risking your life on the front lines. And also, you don't really have to render any specific service for that to take to, to let somebody off all you have to do is just somehow arrange for them to be missed off the paperwork so it, it's always been a corruption prone branch of government and in odessa last year the head of the draft squad or certainly a senior figure within it was arrested on suspicion of taking bribes to allow people to, to dodge the draft which he had apparently spent on a chain of properties in the in southern spain and of course, this was a, this was a pretty bad PR for the Ukrainian government to have, but on the one hand, be telling people that they've got to join up to this new for this new half million mobilisation bill, while some of the people in charge of organising it were allegedly feathering their nests for a sunny retirement in Spain. Oh uh, yeah, just to come back to that, Colin, I, I remember doing a sort of a similar story, not with a draft dodger, but a Ukrainian soldier that had been held as a prisoner of war by Russia, exchanged back into Ukrainian hands, but then essentially told that he had to report back to his unit and undergo testing before he could be exempted from being sent back to the front line and back into service. And at that time, it was a, just before the counteroffensive got under underway people were very spooked about the idea that so the fortress back moot idea was well within focus people were worried that they would be drafted given no training sent to the front line as you were saying but um i remember this chap who we named as genia at the time basically said to me because i asked him about draft dodgers because this was when we, we visited a few i was walking around Kiev at the time where i met him we're walking around draft centres and seeing people going around handing out notices and stuff like that. And how the, summon, the military summons had changed from once being ex- exclusively sent by post to being dropped off at the front door. And I, so I spoke to Genia about what it, what serving soldiers, especially someone like him who had been captured I think, in Syria, Donetsk and, or Lysyshansk, when that fell into Russian hands, those towns, he... Um, basically said that, look, un, uh, in a post-war world, there's going to be a, a, almost a hierarchy of citizens, and there will be men who served in the army and defended their country, were part of this nation of warriors, and then ones who deliberately avoided being called up by staying at different addresses or using these telegram channels to dodge the, uh, to dodge the draft. And he, he said, essentially, the political will and power will be with soldiers who served after the war and not with these guys who were seen to have yeah have duck service and it's just i think it's just quite an interesting way to say maybe not now how it is so people don't want them on the front lines because they could be seen as a as a danger to themselves and other people but after post-world you post-war ukraine what they could be what they could be seen as it's interesting yes absolutely i th- i mean the, as part of the new draft bill that is being debated in parliament i think there are sanctions being considered that would ban people draft dodgers or people who have not fulfilled their military obligations from purchasing properties from traveling abroad and from accessing various other government services so that scenario that you outline of a uh, of, of almost creating a, a kind of making draft dodges second class citizens is one that seems fairly feasible um i've also met people who have signed up for the military actually uh, largely on that basis of not wanting to uh, entertain a scenario in 10 or 20 years time where they sit their children or their grandchildren on their knee um, and when they're asked, what did you do in the war, mummy, or what did you do in the war, daddy, to be told, well, I did nothing, I'm a, I was a draft dodger. So, yeah, it, it, it's definitely an issue that is biting for many people. 
Although I'm saying that sat here back in London on my backside safely. I did ask this guy, Sergey, what would you say to anybody in the West who is reading whatever I write in the paper about my interview with you and who's scoffing, saying, Sergey, you're a, you're a, a feckless coward. And he said, well, look, guys, you come here, you think about what it's like to be facing Vladimir Putin's forces. See how brave you feel when you make that choice. And I think that's probably worth bearing in mind. Yeah, and I, I think the other thing that's quite interesting and wondering if you saw anything of no, because I've spoken to a few people who are going through this mindset at the moment is actually now there's this been this announcement that 500,000 men could be mobilised. There's discussions over it. Have, did you see or speak to anyone who that had changed their mind to almost instead of draft dodging and trying to avoid it, they're again get they're trying to get ahead of the line because they might get a what is seen as a kushtia job rather than a man being sat in a frontline trench. They could get a job as an intelligence officer or potentially a drone operator. Yeah, a couple of miles behind the front line, or rather than a guy sitting on a machine gun post outside Avdivka. I, certainly the Ukrainian government is is trying to go down that route to some extent. What they've said uh, as part of this conscription bill is that um, people should be given the choice uh, to some extent to do what they want to do in the military. And that means, for example, if there's a particular specialism that they want to go into, whether it's drones or being an engineer or whatever, they should have that choice. Partly just to make the whole thing a little bit less of a lottery and feel less intimidating. You have some idea of what you're going to do. And also, but I think, probably to give them the idea that look, you're not going to just get handed a gun and sent in, into an infantry trench. Although I don't really see how they're going to avoid that to some extent. If you've ever watched or talked to infantry soldiers out there, they're talking about doing the infantry charges through trenches and stuff. They say that, that that is the kind of thing that only relatively young men can do, unless you're a very fit 45-year-old. They do mention that they've got a lot of older for soldiers in the infantry forces, and they're not as good at jumping up and down in trenches, dodging grenades, shooting at people for several hours at a time. It's just something that is suited very much to younger men. But certainly the issue of uh, of trying to of being given the option of specialisation is is certainly one. The other thing is, I think that if uh, if you proactively choose to sign up and proactively choose a, a unit, you're likely to get in with a better run unit. Whereas if you leave it to the end, and you're one of the people who's caught up in a big in the net when draft officers swoop, you're probably much more likely to get sent to a unit that um, is struggling for recruitment. And those are the units that often tend to be worse run and often tend to get into more trouble. I did speak to one other guy, actually, who said, I raised this issue of the, the lack of people willing to do the kind of hardline infantry assaults. And he did say, once you get into a unit, you get very much caught up in the, the camaraderie of it. And you end up looking out, looking out for your brothers and sisters, mainly brothers, I think it is, on the front lines. And your mentality can change quite a bit. So it, it is not actually that common. For People might initially go into utterly terrified. They adapt and they learn. He said that there, there are a few people who are just consistently petrified the whole time and that they, they usually weed it out. But it, it's very different for every, for every different person, I guess. Colin, hello mate, it's Dom here. Could I ask a, a question quickly please, take you back to when you were visiting those artillery units. We often get questions from folks asking what the interaction is between soldiers up at the front with any locals who are still around and there, there seems to be almost none right at the very at the front line, at the, the zero line, because that there's simply not a place there for civilians. But as you say, the artillery unit was some distance back from there because of the nature of their role. And so they may have had more interaction, but were they, were these the people you were speaking to, were they, I mean, were they getting supplied with food from the locals? Were they sleeping in the local houses or anything, anything at all with that? What kind of interaction were they having some distance back from the front? Not a great deal, no. I mean, the, the specific unit we went to see were in the middle of a tree line running through a set of very muddy fields. I mentioned that because our car got stuck in the mud halfway towards getting to them, presenting itself as a very prime target for any of those uh, drones that might have been buzzing overhead at the time. We did speak to some people, uh, some soldiers who were based in a house 
somewhere in, in a nearby village. I think they usually will get the odd family coming and giving them vegetables and food and offering them any support that they want. Equally, there are others where they suspect, especially in some of these easternmost areas, that there are people wait calling their positions into the Russians and they have a name for them. I'm not the, the waiting ones or the ones who wait. I think it translates loosely in in English as in people who are waiting for the Russians to come along. So the relationship with the locals is a little bit mixed. But right now, I would say there are far more soldiers in someone like Kupiansk than there are locals anyway. Thanks. And just one more for me, if I may. You mentioned the drone threat. When we were in Kiev, we were speaking to a guy, a volunteer, who used to take runs down to, well, all over, but he'd been concentrating heads on in, in recent weeks. Hello, Jay. And he was saying that actually the tactics the soldiers down there had started to adopt would be that f- any sort of size of, um, of group moving about, there'd always be at least one person standing still and listening and and looking up. And then every few metres, as they're running from cover to cover, everybody would stop for a few seconds and just listen for drones. Easier to hear them than spot in sometimes, he was suggesting. Has that been adopted elsewhere? Have you noticed people people responding to or improvising to get past this relatively new threat of the first-person view drone, certainly, but the, but this awareness that they need to keep an eye up on the sky. Somebody at all times has to be looking up and listening and just bring that into everyday routine as much as you clean your weapon, look after your feet and all that kind of stuff. You have to just think all the time, where's the, where are the drones? Was that in evidence? It was in the sense that when we were up visiting the artillery unit, they on several occasions during a visit of no more than about 90 minutes set up drones up right everybody everybody get down into cover again having to break off what we were doing that though was information that was coming to them being relayed to them automatically online via some sort of aerial monitoring unit which monitors the presence of drones in the area and the idea that you are suggesting of people just keeping an eye in the air and so on I didn't see any of that. Maybe that is a drill that they use much closer to the front lines these days. But, of course, with a lot of the drones, you can't really see them very easily. You can occasionally spot one out of the corner of your eye. But but because they're often flying against an open sky at at a distance that can be anything from 50 feet to 500 feet or 1,000 feet, it, they're a often hard, often far away, and b sometimes difficult just for the eye to focus in on, and you can't hear them because they're too high up, or the noise of the rotors isn't loud enough, or it's obscured by the wind. So, it, unfortunately, it's a pretty uh, inexact science. What I would say is that certainly, in it, from speaking to people in Afdivka, is that you do get the sense of this, the speed at which these drones are becoming the absolute dominant factor on the on the battleground. And I've had the dubious pleasure of watching some of the footage from around Avdivka where you see these FPV drones, which are like sort of small helicopter drones, perhaps um, the size of a maybe a foot and a half across, perhaps slightly bigger, chasing soldiers across the battleground, individual soldiers. It's like watching a giant mosquito pursuing a soldier they will hover they will duck and dive they will reverse on themselves and basically homing in on a target and then landing on the soldier and exploding it's they're not a pleasant sight and you can imagine that in a few years time the the, the same things will be happening but there will just be far more of them and they may well be far smaller and quite possibly capable of flying into the into the dugouts like the one that I was in a few a couple of weeks ago that did at least afford some safety from these things. Thank you very much Colin for all of your time that was really fascinating hearing about your reporting over the past few weeks. Thank you Joe and Dom. Let's move to our final thoughts then. Joe Barnes would you like to go first? Yeah so back end of last week this week I was doing some number crunching having a look at Western support and military commitments to Ukraine in 2024, and looking at the sort of the ever-changing nature of these numbers. And one thing that struck me, I, I wanted to look at support in comparison to GDP of individual countries to get a gauge of how much how much support is being given to Ukraine in in terms of someone's country's economy. And what I discovered was while Britain is still claiming to be at the forefront of 
Western support for Ukraine maybe potentially isn't when you compare it to the sort of size of our economy. So I, I, I put together sort of 10 countries in a list that have all announced their donations to Ukraine in 2024, and Britain came out on 10th, in 10th place. So we, in 2024, have committed 0.11% of GDP to Ukraine. Above us, Lithuania, with again, 1.118 this time. France is even above us on 0.12. Belgium above us, 0.12 as well. Norway, 0.13. The Netherlands, 0.23. Denmark, 0.5% of GDP. And it's just starting to raise the question is, yes, we look at absolute numbers, we look at capabilities that are given, but do we have to look at another way of measuring support for Ukraine to encourage governments to take the next step to further their support? Um, And I was speaking to a senior diplomatic source, I'll name them as, about this. And they were saying, actually, discussion should focus around countries committing 0.5% 0.5% of GDP to, to Ukraine's armed forces. And they say that because it would it's a much cheaper way of deterring Vladimir Putin and whittling down Russian forces now than if Vladimir Putin is allowed to succeed in Ukraine and is then gifted the chance to basically reconstitute his forces and then maybe have a pop at a NATO country or lead to another sort of full-scale war that the West would be invested in, they're basically saying, this diplomatic source is saying, actually 0.5% of GDP now is going to be a lot cheaper than what it costs to fight an actual war. So let's raise the stakes. And I, I just think it's interesting that actually, if you look at sort of Britain's comparable donations, is actually pretty minuscule when you're comparing it in GDP terms, the likes of Denmark on 0.5%. Uh, Latvia on 0.3 percent. Estonia is committing 0.25 percent of GDP over the next four years, and the Netherlands at 2. Point, at 0.2 percent. And it's the, 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 are we now falling down that channel, even though we are increasing our support? And that's that's me done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe Dom Nichols. Thanks, David, and thanks, Joe. Yeah, I mean, it brings to mind the um, the Estonian plan: 0.25 percent. Of GDP for four years committed. We've spoken about that before, but worth worth keeping going in this in this context. But yeah, by what metric should you judge support for Ukraine? Brings me to the reports today by Reuters that Moldova and France are, are going to sign a defence cooperation accord tomorrow, part of the effort to strengthen Moldova's position in face of increasing efforts by Russia to destabilise the country. Now, Russia has troops in Transnistria, the breakaway bit stately if you like of Moldova it's been causing a lot of problems for for decades but the French presidency said in a statement today the defense and economic cooperation accords will be signed when uh, President Macron meets his Moldovan counterpart Maya Sandu in Paris tomorrow Ms Sandu's on her way to well they're going to underline this is going to underline but Mr. Macron sorry, says he will underline his support for the independent sovereignty and security of the Republic of Moldova in the context of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. So yeah, Macron's saying a lot of stuff recently. He's setting a lot of the agenda, which you know, is good, and that has a value, certainly if someone is as influential and in the position of the president of, of, of France. So I want, you know, how, what value do, do you put on that? I would like to see that translate into more hard, hard action. But if it's driving the debate, driving ideas, putting the, the God, clunky phrase warning coming up, but winning the information war, the information space, then that would have a value in and of itself. How much? Probably not enough, but worth looking at. Interesting that um, Moldova, that Francis has been talking about a lot recently, hasn't he, is, is in the four again. And uh, yeah, so keep an eye out tomorrow for this agreement in France between Ms. Sandu and, uh, and President Macron. But an interesting move on the diplomatic front, David. Thank you very much, Joe and Dom. Colin, uh, let's come to you last then. Would you like the very final words for today? Uh, Yeah, if it's the very final words, I'll just be brief. Going back to the issue of drafts and the issue of mobilisation and recruitment, we have heard that the average age of the average Ukrainian soldier serving on the front lines now, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think has been widely cited as aged 48. Um, I would like to just say in in my experience, 
recent experience, I made a point of looking at the soldiers and where I didn't take their ages, I made a rough guess. I don't think it's anything like that at the moment. Um, I am 54. I'm very well attuned to being in the company of other middle-aged men. And while there was a reassuring presence of them, reassuring for me, that is, that there was still a lot of young lads around. And I don't think, I, I, I'm not saying it's wrong, but I would like to see that figure re-examined a bit because from what I could tell, that the median age of the average fighting person on the front line at the moment is not 48. It seems still to be me to be a lot younger than that. I would say maybe 30s or, or late 20s. Uh, the stat, I think, is forty-three. I'm just trying to. I'm just, I'm just googled it very quickly to try and find where that's come from. But that's the that's the stat that was reported on last November. But that's interesting. Thank you very much, Colin. Ukraine: The Latest is an original podcast from the Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis, and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to the Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just one pound at www.telegraph.co.uk/ukraine/the-latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, a world affairs newsletter which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine Live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message and you can contact us directly on Twitter you can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Charles Gear, and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.